Hey, Void, how you doing? So, back on to Friday the 13th. So, Friday the 13th, Part 2, came out in 1981. Set five years after the events of Friday the 13th. So, right here is where we start having some continuity problem breakdowns. Now, Friday the 13th, as you go through all of them, is a continuity nightmare. Nothing makes sense. Nothing adds up. It just... Even in watching the making of documentary, they it openly admitted it's a nightmare. And pretty much a couple of things that they realized that uh, this doesn't make sense. How should we explain it? And they just made the choice not to. This one's not too bad, but it does start setting up the problems for continuity. And there's also the elephant in the room of Jason himself. But, well. First, uh... Things first. Let's discuss this one. So, movie opens with uh, just a couple months after the events of Friday the 13th, where we have, we have Adriana King reprising her role very briefly as Alice, and uh, pretty much gets unceremoniously stalked and killed by a mysterious assailant. Now, this is the only part of this film I really take issue with, is they, they did Alice duty, really. I know they, she was having some issues on whether or not she wanted to reprise her role, so they just, so she agreed to get in just pretty much as a cameo, and in order to get her out, they just decided to kill her off. Which was a shame. She was a likable character, and after everything of surviving the first one, having her just quickly stabbed in the first... 10, 15 minutes of the film is a little bit disappointing. So, but the movie does pick up from there as, well, a camp counselor training center has opened up on Crystal Lake, just down the lake from where Camp Crystal Lake er, was. So, it's not at Crystal Lake, it's er, Camp Crystal Lake itself, it's at its another facility not too far away. Though, as one of the deputies puts out, you're too close. Camp Crystal Lake's been quiet for five years. Don't go stirring things up. They stir things up. So, Jason has become a bit of an urban legend, particularly after the, the rumors of a boy in the lake pulling uh, Alice in. That uh, supposedly he saw his mother get killed, and uh, now is out there lurking, attacking and killing, possibly eating anyone that he comes across who dares stray into his woods. Well, that's pretty much what exactly happens. Now, I'm kind of unclear on uh, J on a little bit of Jason's activities in this one. It's kind of open for interpretation here. Now, Crazy Ralph is the first victim who gets you know, it's killed by Jason. But Ralph has been to Camp Crystal Lake. Now, it's kind of unclear to me whether Jason starts stalking these people because two of the characters, um, who have their names easily? Uh, Jeff. Jeff was one of them. Ah, I don't have it right on hand. Jeff and his girlfriend, I think. I want to say Marcy, but I don't think that's quite right. That might have been someone from the first. Unfortunately, uh, IMDb is currently failing me on that. Well. Anyway, those two do make it a point to sneak into Camp Crystal Lake. So, while Ralph did get killed at the counselor Camp Counselor uh, Training Center before this happened... It's unclear whether Jason would have just left these people alone or not. But, it's kind of, uh, or if, uh, the incursion into his actual territory by Sandra? It might have been Sandra. Anyway, by Jeff and his girlfriend, whether or not they're sneaking into uh, his things is what set him on his killing spree. Kind of a moot point. Killing spree happens regardless. But, 
An interesting thought exercise, I guess. Anyway. It was either Vicky or Sandra. Anyway. But, so, as punishment, uh, and those two are forced to stay at camp while most of the counselors and the leaders go off uh, for a night on the town, but a few other people stay behind to volunteer to just hang out. And these are the people that uh, began getting stalked. Eventually, Ginny and uh, Paul, the people who are running uh, the camp, essentially, come on uh, back and discover, well, no one's there, there's blood everywhere, there's... A... And uh, things have gone awry. And then they end up with the final showdown with Jason. Including uh, Ginny, played by Amy Steele, becoming this one's final girl, as she actually takes the point of using her child psychology training to essentially try to psychoanalyze Jason and eventually impersonate his mother in order to try to talk him down. But there's a lot going on in this movie. The kills get a bit more creative, though there's a few that are a little off-screen, particularly with uh, Terry, but the movie is still enjoyable. It does have a few more criticisms than I would give the first one. Mostly Jason running around with a uh, pillowcase on his head. It's an interesting look. Uh, it's not a bad one, but it's a little too Town That Dreaded Sundown for me. It's If that movie didn't already have done something like that, I think it wouldn't bother me as much. And then when you do finally see Jason unmasked, I think this is my, one of my least favorite Jasons. There's two of them that really didn't work for me, and this is one of them. He's a little too Grizzly Adams. Uh, I mean, one half of his face looks fine, but ain't for a Jason look. The other half is just too much beard and way too long a hair. It's just, Jason is a barely, uh, big, mostly bald, uh, guy with only little scraggly tufts kind of looks better than the really long shaggy hair. A little too mountain man hillbilly I don't know. It just it's my it's not a favorite Jason look for me. Um I know uh, what was the yeah. then Another criticism is the they were trying to do a fake out dream sequence kind of thing, similar to Alice being pulled in by the boy. This one, uh, they have Jason jumping in through the window, but leading to the disappearance of Paul, so you're not. It's kind of unclear what happens to Paul, and I wish a little bit more would have been said on that. Um. Oh. I know I had some other little nitpicks here. Uh. The time frame. Let's get back into that. Now, Jason growing up to becoming the killer, I'm fine with. His mother thinking he drowned, though, how does this exactly happen? Like, he supposedly drowns in the lake. You'd think they would have found his body, but maybe not? So did his body just go missing? Everyone assumed he drowned and his mother went crazy? If his mother kept lurking around the camp, it's kind of implied she was the one tainting the water, burning things down, killing counselors. Why is... didn't she find Jason? Did Jason avoid her? I, I just don't know what happened there. There's... that's kind of the biggest plot hole in the whole Friday the 13th series, and it's a big one. I mean, yeah, they never meant Jason to come, uh, to be alive. The original Friday the 13th was meant to be self-contained. So, but when you decapitate your main villain, and you don't have anywhere to go, resurrecting her son as a killer, okay. But since they weren't going the supernatural route right off the bat, that came much later, it leaves some confusion as to why Jason never contacted his mother. Or if why they never bumped into each other, what since they were both clearly running around the woods. Oh, otherwise this group 
is very likable. There's no one that's really annoying Aang in this one. So you still have the group of likable counselors. So Friday the 13th does a very good job of keeping that. They start losing that a little bit after this point, but never goes as bad as later films, at least until the reboot. Now, let's see. There's one character who is the comic relief one, but he does in a charming kind of way. He's not like an obnoxious one for the character of Ted, and he makes some of the smartest decisions as he ends up pretty much surviving because he just doesn't go back to the camp and hangs out. This movie's two main sins, though, are as one, killing Alice early on just felt like a middle finger to the audience, and killing Crazy Ralph. I love Crazy Ralph. I, I would have loved him to stick around and give us uh, some more of his gospel throughout it. It's a shame that uh, they felt the need to get rid of him that quick. Well, I'll keep talking about the continuity as things come up, because I don't, with how disjoined it is, it is kind of hard to put together. So, for right now, as things currently stand, Friday the 13th happened about or around 1980. Friday the 13th Part 2, therefore would be happening about 1985. And Part 3 I know is a direct sequel, which supposedly happens like the next day. So we'll uh, go from there. And I'll keep trying to piece it together. A lot of these ones just say present day, so I'm trying to assume present day is this, then it is uh, when the movie was made, but we'll see. Okay, Friday the 13th Part 2, oh, haven't given it a MacGuffin count. I gave Part 1 8 MacGuffins. This one, just because there are some flaws that I don't like, it's still really enjoyable. I'm gonna, but I can... Oh, I'm going to knock it down to six MacGuffins just because the flaws are still very prevalent and opening on a bad note, note with Alice, does kind of take a little bit away from the movies. So, part three, we'll see where that fits in, but uh, yeah, six MacGuffins for part two.